All right, good morning, church. Welcome to our first online streaming Sunday. I'm so excited about not having to go to a church building because I just got to get up yeah, and get, get in the Word a little bit. So we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 2 this week. And so if you've got your Bibles, go ahead and grab them because we're going to get into it this morning. Oh, 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 it's hot. It's hot. Honey, the coffee's too hot. It's hot. Anyway, now grab your Bibles. And we're going to get into, oh my goodness, hold on, hold on a second, hold on, get, go and get yourself some coffee. Alright, we're going to try it. Last week, we covered a bit of one, but we went back, and we got it gone, got it gone. And so, we go, hold on, hold on. Oh, it's so hot, stop. <coughs> Honey! Hold right, on, I need napkins. I need napkins. Hold on. Hold on, guys. Just don't go anywhere. I know we're live streaming right now. Oh, my goodness. Oh, wow. <laughs> Let me know. All right. Good morning, church. I don't know how I can uh, maybe overcome that, uh, but it is good to be with you. This is such a weird dynamic we're in, but it's a good thing. Uh, technology uh, can be so good. And so it's good to be with you even though we're not together. And so I'm going to try to segue uh, from that uh, Hollywood level production to our time this morning as we dig in the word. And for those that are uh, watching on Facebook, uh, we're streaming live on Facebook, but we're also streaming live through our website, thewaychurchrva.com slash online dash worship. And so on there, uh, there's several sections. One you can watch, uh, but there's also a prayer request section because we're a praying church. There's a contact card. And so if you're uh, joining us for the first time and uh, you want to uh, just follow up with the Way Church, find out more about the Way Church, uh, and we'd love to have your email so we can get you in our, our distributions. We have a lot of things coming up. We don't want you to miss a thing. Uh, fill out this online contact card, and we'll have one of our team members get a hold of you, and then I'll follow up with you um, as well, and, uh, and even next steps. And so take a look at the contact card if you haven't filled out one yet. And so that's all on our online worship page, which we'll link in the comments as well. And so it is good to be here this morning. Uh, it is so good to be here. We are going to continue our series in Ephesians that we've titled Choices. And so as we've looked throughout the couple weeks, we found out that in Ephesians 1, God made the first choice when he chose us before the foundation of the world. And that choice establishes all the rest of the choices from there on out. We know in 1 John 4 that he first loved us so then we can love. And so that sets the foundation of who and where we are today. And today we're going to be in Ephesians 2. Um, but before we lay, start in Ephesians 2, um, just remind us that, that we have this tension that we see, specifically in Ephesians 1 and 2, uh, of this grace and mercy dynamic and how they're intertwined. And then how forgiveness is laced all through there. So you got grace, mercy, and forgiveness. And those all shape us. And the, the choices we make, and at least they, they should. And so when I look back, Jesus gives a great story that summarizes this well and how we are to make choices with a certain perspective in mind. In Matthew 18, Jesus tells this story to Peter. And Peter says, how many times are we supposed to forgive someone? He says, listen, the kingdom of heaven is like this. And this is found in Matthew 18. He says, there's a king that wants to settle his accounts. And so he brings his servants that owe him to, before him. And a servant comes before him that owed him 10,000 talents. And then the king, the master, says, you owe me. We need to settle these accounts. And the, the servant comes before him and says, I can't pay it. And the master says, well, then I'm selling you. I'm selling your wife. I'm selling your kids and all your possessions. And at that point, the servant fell down face first and says, please be patient with me. Let me pay you back. And it says the master was moved to compassion. And the master forgave him his debts. And so don't miss this because not only did the master forgive his financial debts, but he also released him from the bondage that was coming. And so that man walked away that day free. But then what did he do? 
he, as he was walking, he came across another fellow servant that owed him 100 denarii, just a small fraction of what he owed his master. And he grabbed this guy. He choked him and said, you pay me what you owe. And this guy begged for mercy. And this servant showed him no mercy and had him thrown in jail until he could pay him back. Well, the other servants saw what this uh, servant had done and were disturbed. And so they ran back to the master and said, listen, this is what this servant just did. And so the master called this servant back to himself. He said, you wicked servant. How are you going to not show mercy to someone when I just showed you great mercy? Therefore, I'm going to throw you in jail and you will be tortured until you can pay back what you owed. And then Jesus says this. Based on the story, he says, in the same way, our Father in heaven will treat you if you do not forgive your brothers and sisters in the same way in your heart. Now that should shake us to our core because this is what we're getting to this morning and sets the foundation of where we're at today. We're talking about unity. So if you walk away at one point, the one point is unity. And we're going to look at scriptures to see biblical unity. And so first, let me, before we start in Ephesians 2, turn with me to John chapter 17. So I want you to see this prayer that Jesus prays before his disciples, for his disciples, plus for some other people as well, which we'll see in John 17, verse 20. Jesus prays this. He says, I pray not only for these. And so he's talking about his disciples. He says, I pray not only for these, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Now grasp this just for a second. He is praying for you and for me and for everyone that has come to him through their word, right? Past, present, future. Through their word. Verse 21. This is what he's praying. He says, may they all be one. So he's praying for everyone that they may all be one as you, Father, are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe you sent me. I have given them the glory you have given me so that they may be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me so that they may be made completely one. That the world may know you sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. So let me just pause just for a second and let me ask this. If you think Jesus prayed this and the reason he prayed this, do you think it's important? Do you think there's a, there's a, there's a need for oneness if Jesus is praying this on behalf of his disciples and everyone else? Yeah. There's no doubt it's important. Because here, here, here's the truth, right? Unity is easy. Right? Dealing with people, people are easy, right? No. No, people aren't easy. People are not easy. People are people, right? We know that we all have this sin nature, and we're all born selfish. And so just think for a second. All the disagreements you've had, at the root of them, I'm willing to bet it's because someone didn't get their way. Let's be honest. Someone didn't get your way. Married couples, real quick, go ahead and turn to each other and tell them how they, it was their fault, your last argument. Go and do that real quick. No, don't do that. That's bad pastoral advice. Do not do that. Don't do that. No, put it in the comments instead. No, don't do that either. No, don't do any of that. Don't do that. But listen, think about the disagreements and arguments that you've had in your life. And at the foundation of them, there's a pride issue and there's a selfishness issue. And so... Jesus is praying this because he knows people, right? People are people. Relationships are messy. And unity, listen to me, church, unity is something you have to strive for and choose. Unity is something you have to choose 
and strive for. And let me just clarify two things. When I speak about biblical unity, there are things that will bring disunity and that maybe they should. And so we can't possibly cover everything we need to right now, but everything stems from the word of truth, God's word, John 17, 17, God's word. And so if it's not aligned with God's word, if, if, if it comes from something else, if, if this isn't the source of unity, then there will be disunity. There's so many things that go into that, but just, just hear me, church. This is the source of our unity. We come back here. And if things are not aligning with this, then there can be disunity. And maybe sometimes there should be disunity. But let me caution you. What I'm not saying is that we can't disagree. What I am saying is it's how we disagree should be God-glorifying in a way that builds each other up. We're going to disagree. We're going to disagree. But here is a slippery slope of disagreement that we have to face the reality in. and We have to, to fight against. See, it starts with disagreement, but if it's not resolved, it turns into division. And if it's not nipped in the bud there, it turns into disunity. Disagreements, division, disunity. Let's solve it at the disagreement part. It's good to disagree sometimes. But when we disagree, can we just stop for a second and put ourselves in the other person's shoes and just assume just for a second that we might not be right? Or maybe we're not seeing things the same way and be quicker to hear and slower to speak. Almost sounds biblical. So with all that set in the foundation, we're actually going to start with today's word in Ephesians 2. So if you're not there yet, go and turn to Ephesians 2, starting in verse 11. And as we do here at the Way Church, even in your living room or wherever you're at, unless you're driving, okay, this is the caveat. I'm like, if you're driving, don't stand up right now. Fair enough? Good. Go and stand up in the honor of the word of God in reverence and respect for God's word. And we're going to read Ephesians 2, 11 through 14 this morning. So honor the word of God. We'll stand up and start in verse 11 of Ephesians 2. It says, So then, remember that at one time you were Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcised by those called the circumcised, which is done in flesh by human hands. At that time you were without Christ excluded from the citizenship of Israel and foreigners to the covenants of promise without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who made both groups one and tore down the dividing wall of hostility. Father, Lord, I ask that you bless this time. Father, as we gather together to look at your word, Father, let it change our hearts. Let it stir within us, Father, a change that you're wanting to make, Father. Let us bring us closer to you, Father, and see you for who you are and your goodness and how that relates to how we treat others, how we live our lives, Father. Lord, we give all this time to you this morning. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. So let me just clarify a couple things in this verse, right? Let's, let's look at this. You have two groups that are identified, the Uncircumcised and circumcised, also known as the Jews and Gentiles, or your translation may say Greeks. And so this circumcision was, it goes back to Genesis. and starts in Genesis 12 with the calling of Abraham as he starts establishing, by God's call, the nation of Israel. And they were set apart by the sign of circumcision. Well, here in the church, this was causing issues because the Gentiles were looked at as less than because... They were those people. And so you see at verse 12, it says, At that time you were without Christ, excluded from the citizenship of Israel and foreigners to the covenant's promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now, but now, if you back up, because we this is all one letter, right? If you back up to verse 8, we know it's by grace through faith that we are saved in Christ. And so that is the leveler of all playing fields. We're saved by grace through faith 
And that's everyone. Not by works. It is through faith alone in Christ alone. And so that's when you come to the but now in Christ, you who are far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. We're all the same in our standing for a holy God. We're all born with the sin nature called children of wrath, as we've seen early in Ephesians 2. But because of his rich mercy, he has made us alive in Christ Jesus. And there's no distinction. And so turn with me, back just a couple pages. Galatians 3. Galatians 3.28 says this. There is no Jew or Greek, slave or free, male and female, since you are all one in Christ Jesus. We're all made one because of Christ. So in Christ, in him, Ephesians 1, we are declared righteous. Without Christ, we're still under the wrath of God. Without Christ, we're called dead in our sins and trespasses, helpless, enemies, haters of God. In Christ, we're called blameless, righteous, holy, alive in Christ. There's no distinction because of Christ Jesus. And he did all this in verse 16, it says, in Ephesians 2, he did this so that he might reconcile both to God in one body through the cross, by which he put the hostility to death. He came and proclaimed the good news of peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. Verse 16, it says you both. That means everyone. Because you both is the Jews and Gentiles. So that's put everyone together and says, I have come to God through the cross. Because of the person and work of Jesus Christ, we all have access back into the relationship we were meant to have in the first place. We were both brought back and put the hostility to death. There's, there's two dividing walls of hostility. I know it says one here, but think about it. There is a dividing wall of hostility between Jews and Gentiles that was torn down because there's no distinction. We're all sinners saved by grace. But there's a dividing wall of hostility between man and and God. Righteous, holy, just, sinners condemned, unrighteous, rebelled man. But in Jesus, Jesus tore down the dividing wall of hostility so now we are reconciled, right? There was two parties that were at tension. They were against each other, but God reconciled us. He brought us back together through his death, burial, resurrection, and made us alive in Christ, those who are in him, who heard the message of hope, the gospel of our salvation. Ephesians 1.13, Romans 1.16. It says, and he proclaimed the good news of peace in verse 17, to you who are far away and to those who are near. For through him, we both, again, everyone has access through the Spirit to God the Father. Jesus is the one that changes everything. Then we come to verse 19. It says this, so then, all right, so he said, take, take all that into account, and because of all that, so then you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household, being built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole building being put together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you are also being built together for God's dwelling in the Spirit. In Christ Jesus, we were once foreigners, strangers, exiles, but through him, we are now fellow citizens with the saints, members of God's Household, As we saw earlier, we are co-heirs with Christ because of him. This should change everything. As we talk about unity, whether it's unity in relationships, unity in your family, unity in the church, can we still strive and can we start striving even more to put our preferences aside and strive for unity with each other? 
So that when the onlooking world looks on in the church, they see unity in Christ. Unity because of what Jesus has done. Because one day we saw in Revelation 7, there will be a humongous gathering, a party going on in heaven with representatives from every tribe, tongue, nation, praising God together. So let's start now. Unity in the family dynamics. Can we go back to the word of God and see the structure he took put place for, he, for his glory? We're going to get to it in Ephesians 5 and 6. But he, God created this family dynamic to bring him glory. Can we put down our pride and start walking in humility? Can we put to death our old self? It's still going to be a fight. Can we fight off our old self and strive to live in the newness of life that we have in Christ Jesus? Jesus. And as we get ready to close here, I want you to hear this. As I plead with us for unity, as we see in the scriptures, this letter to the Ephesian church, we still have the same issues in the local church here. This, this spirit of divisiveness that we have to fight off. Can we handle disagreements in a way that's Christ honoring with care for one another? And don't let it get to the division point. Handle disagreements in a way that loves one another because of the love that Christ has shown us. And a lot of that comes with forgiveness. Forgiveness is something you have to keep choosing. And even when you've forgiven someone of something terrible, it doesn't necessarily go away, yes? You have to fight. You have to keep forgiving. You have to keep reflecting on, God forgave me. As Paul says, the chief among sinners. If God has forgiven us, how could we not then forgive others and strive for the unity that brings God's glory? And so here this church, Ephesians 4, as we close. Ephesians 4, verse 1, the Apostle Paul is pleading by the Holy Spirit to this local church, but I want you to hear it coming from me to you. It says in verse 1, Therefore, so he says all this, Therefore, I, the prisoner in the Lord urge you to live worthy of the calling you have received. So that calling is your call in Christ Jesus. So that calling you have received to come to Christ, you're now in him. I urge you to live worthy of that. He continues, with all humility and gentleness. Now let me pause there for a second, because if we are striving to live in the calling that we receive with all humility and gentleness, how would that change your relationships? How would that change your family dynamic? How would that change your marriage? How would that change your friendships? Your, you, how you parent? How you, how you uh, lead? How would that change? How would that change the dynamics in the church? If we are living with all, not with some, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, patience. Is that your spiritual gifting? Uh, it's hard, right? We have to choose to be patient. And it sure helps when we gain the right perspective on how patient God was with us. Humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another. Does that sound easy? No. Bearing with one another takes work. But can we bear with one another out of love for one another? Bearing with one another in love and making every effort. Hear me, church. Making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. We, as brothers and sisters in the body of Christ, have this bond of peace because of Jesus. Can we strive? Can we labor? Can we bear with one another for God's glory and to bring others to himself and to build this church? I can tell you my prayers quickly changed as God called us to plant this church. When I say us, I, it, he plants this church. We were just going in obedience. My prayers quickly changed from God, plant this church, bring people to yourself. Two, God, plant this church, bring people to yourself, and keep unity in this local body of believers. And my prayer is still that, for unity, 
for us. Because in a world that's so disunified, I have to be honest, this is the most unified I've seen. And still there's still disunity. We're, we're somewhat unified on our response to this pandemic. I can tell you, across the nation, pastors are very unified with ways they're trying to engage their congregation right now. But not everyone's on the same page still, and that's okay. But can we strive to keep the unity? My prayer is still for us to be unified. Again, in a world that's largely and vastly disunified, let them look into the church and see a unity that we have because we all have the most important thing in common, and that is Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. And as we close church, I know there's many watching on or may watch later as we, as we archive this video that maybe you don't know Christ. Maybe today is your day of salvation. Maybe you've been striving to do things your way. It just isn't working. Maybe you feel all this pent-up aggression or hostility because you haven't been forgiven of your own past circumstances. You haven't forgiven yourself. You haven't forgiven others. And you don't know the peace that comes from Christ Jesus that surpasses all understanding. Maybe today is your day of salvation. If that's you, I'm going to pray for you in just a minute. But maybe as you're listening on, you have some relationships that are just rocky at best. Maybe you and your wife are just tension-filled right now. Maybe it's time to first ask God for forgiveness and then go seek reconciliation, resolution, forgiveness in the relationships in order to bring God glory. Sometimes it's hard because it, we don't want to. Our flesh says no. Our pride says no. Like they, It's their fault. I'm not forgiving. That, that's, that's on them. It's not what God did. It's not what he did for you. It's not what he did for me. Even when we were dead in our sins and trespasses, rejecting God, rebelling against him, he came on a rescue mission through the person and work of Christ Jesus, reconciling, saving us to himself. Should we not do the same? Reflect on that Matthew 18 passage. So church, let me pray for you. And let's seek unity together. Here, pray with me, church. Father, Lord, I thank you for the encouragement that your word brings, Father. I thank you for the, the conviction it often brings, Lord. I pray that you continue to mold and shape us more in your image. Father, if there's anyone listening right now, Lord, I pray uh, those that don't know you, that they finally humble themselves and realizing I've been trying way too hard on my own strength and power and I can't do it anymore Father I pray that you save them Lord help them to come to you help them to see your goodness and the forgiveness that's available through Christ Jesus Lord if that if they're listening now Father as you stir and work in hearts Father if, if you're hearing these words and you're listening on right where you are you just pray to Jesus just cry out to him right now and say, Lord, I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. Lord, I see your goodness, Father, and I ask for forgiveness for everything I've done. Lord, I desire a relationship with you. I will put my life in your hands because you are God and I am not. Or if you're praying just for reconciliation right now, God's put on your heart that you have relationships that are not resolved, that are unhealthy, and they're damaged and fractured and divided. I pray for you right now that you seek a restoration in relationships. Give boldness to pursue relationships. And I pray that God blesses your boldness in laying down your pride, your boldness in pursuing with humility. Lord, I ask that all this time that we've given here, that you continue to draw many to yourself. Lord, I pray for relationships to be restored. I pray for this church, this local church, the Way Church, to continue to be built for your glory and to be unified, showing the unity that's available in Christ Jesus. Father, we thank you for this time. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. And listen, we're a praying church. And so again, if you go online, thewaychurchrva.com slash online-worship, there's three things you can see on there besides the stream. So we got the connection card. And so if you're just joining us for the first time, go online and fill out the connection card. We would love to know and meet you. There's a prayer request. And so we want to pray for you. We're a praying church. There's power in prayer. 
And so we want to pray for you. And then giving. This is still worship. And so everything we do in this worship gathering, even though we're remote, is worship, including giving. And so we worship through music, which I sent you earlier. I worship through the word, worship through prayer, and we worship through giving. So to make it easy, we have three ways to give. And once changed, you can now mail your checks in uh, until we start meeting together again corporately. You can go online or you can text to give. However you choose to give, I want you to do it out of a joyful and grateful heart because of what God's doing in your life. God's building this church. And I'm so privileged to be your pastor. And so as we close, I'm going to pray for you. As we do every week, I want to commission you because there's a mission field out there. There's a hurting world that needs the reconciliation, the love, and the peace that comes through Christ Jesus alone, and you are the ambassadors for Christ. So let me pray for you, and let us go and be the church and make disciples. That's what's so good about being portable because we are so understanding that the church isn't the building, it's a people. So let me pray for us. Father, give us the boldness to go and speak your good news, Father. Help us to remember that point of salvation where we put our life in your hands. Let us go and express the freedom and love that's available through Christ Jesus, the joy that we have because of Jesus in our life. Go before us, go with us, give us an urgency to reach those that don't know you. And give us opportunities that where you're already working. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.